Today's message is, how do I read this thing? Uh, the reason I thought this would be a, a good message for us is, if you weren't here last week, last week I mentioned uh, a, a story in the Gospels where Jesus was confronted by Pharisees and religious leaders, and he was challenged over his practices regarding their traditions and their understanding of Scripture. And it ruffled their feathers quite a bit. In fact, uh, we even looked at some of the specific passages in Scripture, like the holiness codes in Leviticus. Uh, we mentioned those. We talked about Psalm 1-1, uh, which was a big tradition about who you eat with, who you hang around with. And Jesus was pushing up against these things, so much so that in the Gospels, as he continues to do these things, push up against the way that Scripture has been read and interpreted and practiced over time, they eventually kill him for it and for his claims. And so today, we're looking at a passage directly after Psalm 1-1, because the traditions that were so important to the Pharisees about who you ate with, who you sat with, the holiness codes, uh, had a lot to do with living a life that would be blessed by the divine. And so here's our passage for today, and then we're going to get into it even a little bit more. Our passage for today says, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night? That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Show of hands, who wants that? Right? I mean, I mean, like, it's just, it's, it sounds good. It sounds great. I would like to prosper in whatever I do. I would like to be firmly planted. I would like to never wither. This sounds good. Great. And this passage comes directly after Psalm 1-1, which is what the Pharisees were pushing back against Jesus, saying, hey, you eat with sinners and mockers. Psalm 1-1, right before this, said, don't hang out with the wicked, don't sit with the, the people who sin, don't eat with mockers. Like, that's basically what it said. And then there's this passage. So the question is, how do you read this thing, this book, so that you can attain what this passage is talking about. This principle, this promise of being planted by waters where you're, you're, you're not, not going to wither away. Your faith isn't going to wither away to where you feel like you have the capacity of prospering in the name of Jesus regardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in. I do not believe that this is a promise of the easy life. Looking, in, looking into Israel's history, we know that the Jewish people have suffered a lot. This is not a promise for the easy life. But the question is, how do we do this? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of overwhelming feelings when it comes to figuring out, how do I read this thing? <laughs> in fact, if you were to do some research and find out what are the top reasons people don't read the Bible. By the way, when I say people, I mean Christians. I specifically looked up why Christians have a hard time reading the Bible, and it's pretty much a very similar reason across the board. But here's some of the ones that you come up with. I don't, we don't have time. We feel like we don't have enough time to read Scripture because look at this thing. It's humongous. When's the last time you sat down and read a book that big? I mean, this is big print. Don't get me wrong. This is my dad's old Bible. This is big print. But still, it seems massive. So we feel like you don't have time because it seems like the task at hand is bigger than the time that you have available in order to actually be able to understand it. It's too difficult to understand. It's, it can be so hard to understand. So not only is it massive... Does it take lots of time? It's also very difficult to understand. There isn't a lot of agreement on it in, in some places. Sometimes we even know where to start. Again, look how big it is. If I was picking this thing up and wanted to start reading it, where do I start? Do I start at the beginning? Do I start in the middle? Do I start at the end? Do I just read what I want to read? Like, what do I do with this thing? Or it's just not relevant to my life. Like, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't seem to apply to me. Like, 
I pick up, I read it, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, what, what do I do with this? How does this affect me? And lastly, another statement, it's just boring. Sometimes reading the stuff on the page is boring. Numbers, the book of Numbers, can, can be boring. It can be boring. In other words, friends, we have some genuine challenges when it comes to reading this thing. We do. They're there, and they're there for everybody. We also have some major obstacles. And I think that, that this is where we begin to feel those previous things that we just talked about. Now, depending on your translation, how many chapters, verses, words are in the Bible? 1,189 chapters, 31,000 verses, 807,000 words. It's a lot. It's a lot. So reading and understanding the Bible, we have some big obstacles to overcome because of where this book comes from. Cultural, historical context. This book has been written over hundreds and thousands of years in various cultures and in one culture that has changed and evolved over time. In different historical contexts where the challenges that we're facing the people at the time are not the same in other times that the Bible is being written. The way that they practice clothing, food, relationships, marriages, funerals, parties, festivals, holidays, everything different. Everything different. They still experience the plight of humanity and struggle with a lot of the things of what it means to be human in this world. That's a lot of culture. That's a lot of historical context to try to absorb in order to be able to understand this thing. What about the language barriers we have? The Bible wasn't written in English. It was primarily written in Hebrew, Greek, some Aramaic, then translated into Latin, then translated into German, then translated into other languages. And it can be difficult at times going from inflected ancient languages to modern grammatical English. That's why we have so many different translations. I will say this, that all translations are about 98% the same. About 98% the same. You will get some differences here and there. But by and large, 98% the same. But when you want to get into the nuts and bolts of actually interpreting the ancient scrolls, boy, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to understand those language barriers. Not only understanding the language barriers of where they come from, but the idioms. In other words, the idioms, the colloquial things we say. For example, if I were to tell you, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you know what I'm saying. You all know what I'm saying. If I were to drop myself into first century Judaism and say that, they'd be like, what are boots? <laughs> right? Like, they'd be like, what are bootstraps? The reason being is because we have an idiom in our language that communicates an idea in your head when I say it. They had those too. And sometimes we read them in scripture in English and we don't hear it because it has a phonet has a um, a sound in the Hebrew or the Greek language that helps tra communicate what it's trying to make you think. But we miss it because it's not in Hebrew or Greek. That does happen. How about the literary complexity of this book? You have poetry. You have writings. You have prophecy. You have wisdom literature. You have just historical literature. You have gospels. You have epistles. You have apocalyptic literature, all in one book, which is more like a library of books. This is more of a library of books collected together and given to us. But that's a lot of different genres. When you pick up and you read a fiction book, you might read it a little bit differently when you're picking up a historical book and trying to read it to absorb wisdom from the past, right? If you're picking up poetry, and you're trying to evoke more uh, emotive, sensational feelings that allow you to be more expressive or to feel certain feelings that you need to have come out in your journey of faith. You might read that poetry differently than you read the warning of a minor prophet. 
different feelings, different genres, different ways of writing. And it does come out when you read it. And lastly, some of the top obstacles we face are biases and preconceived notions. The concept, the idea that we know more than we actually know, or that we already have it figured out, or that our denomination has taught us this, or my church has taught me this, or my uh, faith before me has taught me this. This is what has been passed down to me. There are preconceived notions that oftentimes need to be unlearned or challenged or looked at. And sometimes those are the top obstacles that we face when it comes to reading and understanding the Bible because we like confirmation bias. We love confirmation bias. Nobody wants to find out that I, I thought I, I had it right and it was different because we want to derive security and strength from our scripture. So how do I read this thing? Right? How do I read this thing? Here's what I want you to know, folks. My goal here is not to give you the, the tool belt for the nuts and bolts and how to practice hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art and science of interpreting the Bible. That's where you get into the minutia of the Sea Scrolls, uh, or of the old papyra, and you're looking at the languages, and you're interpreting, and you're looking at the usage rate, when it was written, all that stuff. I'm not here to tell you the nuts and bolts of which commentaries to use, which websites to go to, how much you should read in your day, right? Oftentimes we have this mindset of the Bible's a task, that I'm, I have to read this thing in order to either maybe be a good Christian, maybe that's what we think in our mind, I'm a good Christian if I read the whole Bible, uh, or we think I can't really say anything, I can't really have an opinion about Scripture or God or theology until at least I can say I've read the Bible. So in other words, that's almost like saying I need to load my gun, I need to load my theological gun so I can participate, <laughs> right? I, that's not my goal today. My goal today is to give you a framework for how to even begin to approach this thing before we open it. And here's my presupposition for you today. The way I'm going to teach this is that you already believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior. That's the presupposition. You believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior that he died and he rose again. Now, the reason I say that is because if I was trying to teach you about how to approach the Bible as someone who had no faith at all, that's an entirely different approach. There's a lot of different questions that have to be answered and brought up, and that's not what I'm going to be doing here today. So this is not an apologetic sermon about Scripture. This is a, an assumption that you already believe this, and if that's the case, I want to help you approach this book in a way that's going to make you believe that what was talked about in Psalm 1, 2 through 3 is available to you today. Here's the thing I want you to remember, and this is pretty easy. How many of you have ever um, seen C4 in a movie, television, anything? C4. Yeah, boom, explodes, right? Okay, so just remember C4. You want to blow up, blow open this Bible and have it impact your life, you want to blow open the pressure that you have on how to read the Bible, just remember C4. I'm going to give you four C's, four C's today that are going to help get you into this. So I want to have that image in your mind so that as you approach this, you can always remember it. The first, and this is the foundational one, and I'm going to talk about why, is that the first thing you need is a Christ-centered lens. When approaching Scripture, you will need a Christ-centered lens. Why? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is a very, very popular verse, John 14, 6. And this is Jesus, again, speaking in, an in a time when he's teaching, has parables, and they're asking, and, and the disciples ask him, hey, where are you going? You say you're going to this place here that you're going to die. What's going on? We want to go after you. We want to follow you. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What is this statement coming from? Why is Jesus saying this? Jesus is making himself the very center 
of this movement, the very center of how you even begin to approach the divine. Why? Because in the Israel's tradition, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible specifically, the Torah was known as the way, the halakha. It refers to collective body of Jewish religious laws derived from written and oral tradition. That's the Talmud. There was the written tradition of the actual Torah, and then there was the oral tradition that was written down and passed down that went alongside of it. When you think about that oral tradition, you go, how powerful was it? Think about the Catholic Church. Think about the Catholic Church, how outside of Scripture being elevated to sola scriptura, as in whatever Scripture says is what is authoritative, in the Catholic Church, you have the ability for the Pope to declare the Word of God. And it becomes as authoritative as Scripture. So in a similar way, you have Talmud in Jewish history, which has a ton of authority as an oral tradition that is passed down. And it was known as the way. You want to be blessed by God. You want to be Jewish. You want to be one of the chosen people of God. You need to follow the way. The truth, Emmet, Torah, was understood to reveal God's truth. This is also the Midrash. This is where the rabbis and the teachers of the law would interpret and do the theology and the debating. This is the Midrash, where they would get in there and wrestle with it and pull out that truth. Today, when theologians practice this, we call it exegesis. It's not like exiting Jesus. It's just the, the Greek word. <laughs> then it means to pull truth from the text. To allow the text to speak light and truth into your light. We still practice this today. And lastly, the life, Chaim, the Torah leads to life. This was understood. Deuteronomy 9, 30, 19 through 20. Let me read this to you. This is Moses. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord has swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. In Israel's history, in Jewish tradition, the Torah was the way, the truth, and the life. And this was how you were going to experience God's prosperity, was through your ability to understand, to practice, and to follow the way, the truth, and the life. So when Jesus in the New Testament says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that is a very Christ-centered lens through which you interpret everything. Why would that be important? A Christ-centered lens. Let's talk about what this does for us. A Christ-centered lens replaces the focus from practice to personhood. So even in the scriptures that we talked about last week, there was a debate over the practice on how to do this scripture. Whereas what Jesus is doing, while he does focus on the behaviors that come out of your heart, he does care about the behaviors that we do, the focus is now on the person of Jesus Christ, not simply on quantifying the practice itself. It's a little hard to understand, but as you read through Scripture, you're going to see things where Jesus will say, Woe to you Pharisees, for you follow the law, even down to the minutia of tithing your spices, but you don't do this. And Jesus will embody the fulfillment of what it's meant to be. And oftentimes that fulfillment pushes back against the current interpretation and practice. And it ruffles feathers and you see that fighting happening in the gospel. It replaces it from a legalistic practice to a focus on a person, on personhood. It removes the conflict of the univocal lens approach. And this is one of the most challenging things I think Christians face today when it comes to reading Scripture, and it's a big pressure, and it's mixed with a little bit of theology. So let me unpack this one a little bit. When you think about God and the way that we're taught about God is that there's one God revealed in three persons, the same, the same ontology, the same essence, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
And then we also hold this belief that Scripture is inspired by this God. And so sometimes there's the pressure or there's the idea to believe that there is one singular presentation being made by God in Scripture so that the voice behind it is a univocal voice. And what that ends up doing is causing many people confusion and conflict. Because the presentation of the divine is not univocally the same in every single book that is contained within the Bible. For example, many of us have struggled with the challenge of reconciling the imagery of the God of the Old Testament in specific stories that you know with the imagery of God in the New Testament that you know. That difficulty in reconciling that, some of that is born out of this idea that all of Scripture has to give a singular, univocal presentation of the divine, and it doesn't. It doesn't. It gets rid of that. What Jesus does is say that the most important thing for interpreting God in Scripture is Him. This is Himself. When the disciples say, how do we see this God? And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's making it himself. So it removes this, that conflict a little bit. And why is that important? Because it offers clarity into the differences of divine revelation in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So friends, can I answer for you why God chose to act and reveal God's activity the way that God did in the Old Testament. Here and there I can. Here and there. Because sometimes God tells us. But why does God decide to use sacrifices? Why does God have a tolerance and a threshold for eventually sending the people of Israel into exile through war or famine, and other times God is a little bit more lenient. Am I able to get into the mind of God and explain that? No, I'm not. And is that challenging because of what I believe of God now today? Yes, it can be. And so here's where that presupposition of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection comes into play. Because if Jesus is claiming that he's the center of how you're going to approach and believe and understand both the Bible and God, then his claims have to be vindicated. And that's what the resurrection does. It vindicates those claims and says that he was telling the truth. So therefore, what I do is I give more precedence to Jesus Christ, to the revelation of God through Jesus Christ, than anything else, including how God is revealed in the Old Testament, including. I don't have the ability to completely reconcile everything, but I do uphold that the most crystallized version and revelation of God that we have today is Jesus Christ. Therefore, I will interpret God's character, God's mission, God's purpose, God's heart for us, God's justice, God's mercy, all of it through Jesus Christ. All of it. That doesn't answer everything for me, but that is the image that I use to uphold how I'm going to understand God. And, the re and again, it helps me get through some of the problems. It doesn't answer them entirely, but my claim is this. I might not know the answer entirely, but I do know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died and resurrected, and his claims were vindicated, and therefore it is not a univocal approach to Scripture. What Jesus says matters more. That's what got him killed, was that he kept saying what I'm saying and doing matters more. In fact, if you look at his Sermon on the Mount, it was literally the reinterpretation of so many laws and traditions that have been passed down where he's saying, you have heard it said, but I say. He's elevating himself in authority in the way that Scripture is meant to be interpreted. And so I look at 
God, and I'd read the scripture through a Christ-centered lens. Here's one caveat, and I will say this. The one caveat is that when you read the Old Testament in a biblical study manner, trying to study it, read it as if the New Testament doesn't exist. Do you, you will understand the New Testament more if you do your best to let the Old Testament stand on its own and understand the people, the cultures, and what's going on there instead of trying to superimpose New Testament information or principles into the Old Testament. In fact, if you can read the Old Testament and let it stand on its own as if that was the only Bible that was available to the people, then you will come to understand the challenges in the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ in the New Testament so much more. And the last, and the last thing I, I really appreciate about, about Christ Center Lens, it creates a starting point and a fallback point. Where do I start reading Scripture? What do I do? Jesus. If you already believe in Jesus Christ, if you've already had an experience of God's grace and mercy that has beckoned you to follow him, to come to the table of grace, start with Jesus. Get to know Jesus as much as you possibly can. And you might say, but if I read the Gospels, I don't know all this culture and everything. Okay, look what he does. Just simply look at what Jesus is doing in the Gospels and then start to ask questions. But any time I talk to someone and they say, I'm a new Christian, where do I start reading Scripture? The Gospels. The Gospels. Get to know Jesus. Learn about Jesus. Learn, see what he actually did. And any time I'm always like, ah, what, what could I learn about more? If I find out if there's something I'm falling back on, Jesus. Always. Because there is no amount of learning that you can do in this lifetime that will ever capture the totality of who Jesus is. It's not going to happen. Because if, God is, because if Jesus is both fully God and fully man, that fully God part means that we can never fully comprehend because Jesus is not finite. We are. Therefore, there's always more to learn. Always. Especially especially because as we go through life in our finite form, our perspective changes on so many different things. It's, I, always, I can't tell you how many times I've gone back to Jesus and seen it differently just based on my life experiences. Jesus always creates a starting point and a fallback point. So that's the first C, a Christ-centered lens. You want to approach this book, approach it with a Christ-centered lens that says, I'm going to come up to some things that I don't understand, but when it comes to God and how I think about God and how God interacts with us, I'm going to allow the revelation of Jesus Christ to hold precedence over everything else. Another one is to commit to a path of growth. It's not a sprint, friends. It's not a sprint. It's not, a, it's not a, a see how many, you know, a theological weapons I can put in here to get into those arguments type of, of race. It's not a matter of proving that you're a good Christian. Studying the Torah or Scripture or the Bible is a long endeavor. In fact, Rabbi Akiva, a very popular one, who wrote in one of those other books that we talked about earlier, the study of Torah is a lifelong endeavor. It is the bread of life which must be savored slowly to nourish the soul fully. I like that image so much more than the idea of a race or a task or like a checkbox or like, oh, I got my chapter in today, so now I can feel good. No. Think about Scripture as nourishing your soul as a meal that you can have over and over and over and over again. It's not about trying to just get it done. It's about letting it seep into who you are. If the purpose of Scripture is to help you live fully, to have the way, the truth, and the life, this is something that's going to develop over time, and it's going to come into a fruition inside of you. So don't feel like you have to race. 
Because truthfully, just because you read the Bible all the way through doesn't mean that you understand it any more than the person who's taking their time and meditating on it, thinking about it, and is only a, maybe a few books in. Just because you have put the information across your eyes doesn't mean you've taken the time to chew on it, to think about it, to ask yourself some questions about how it applies or, or what the history is behind it. It's not a race. We need to take the time to commit to a path of growth. In other words, I'm not going to be there yet. I can tell you the truth, friends. I used to be depressed that I couldn't figure that I wouldn't arrive at a place where I would have absolute peace in my knowledge of God. It kind of ticked me off, to be honest. Once I got to the place where, because I, once you get to the place where you keep reading and studying and uh, spending time with God, I got to this place, and I've said it before, this yawning gap where I'm like, man, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And so I had this point in my own personal journey where I had to accept that I will always be in a position of learner. Always. When it comes to God, theology, I might teach others here and there, but my posture is one of learner for the rest of my life. And I found out that's great because I can grow the rest of my life rest of my life. Now, for those of you that are sitting here, there are things that are said about human beings that as we age, we kind of become more concrete that we don't, you know, we can't learn, we can't grow as we get older, we get set in our ways. Scripture and God suggest that no matter what age you're at, you can still grow. You can still grow. In other words, friends, you're not done. I think that's great. There's more. There's purpose. There's more to be discovered. You can still grow. And I think that's awesome because that means that I'm not done. I, I, the, the joy of knowing that my God has more for me always is a posture of growth. Commit to a path of growth. Eugene Peterson said the Bible is not a script for a funeral service, but it is a record of God always bringing life where we expect to find death. Everywhere, it is the story of resurrection. It is a path of growth. It is not simply a script for a how-to-do. Again, this kind of goes back to Jesus when he made it less about the legalistic practice and about personhood. Another C. Third one. The courage to stand corrected. The Apostle Paul, in a combination of Psalms, says this, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. The way a fool seems to write to them, but the wise listen to advice. One of the most painful experiences I had in my life is the, is the, is the changing of a theological belief. Was one of the most, it's one of the most painful experiences I've had of going through life or seeing certain things that really challenge what you already believe. Many people experience those things in times of loss, in times of hardship, in times of displacement, in times of war, in times of health issues, in times of divorce, in times of economic struggle in times of poverty, where your personal experience or what you witness to the people you love or your community pushes up against your current understanding of who God is and how God interacts in the world and specifically in your life. And sometimes the willingness to be corrected on a theological position, on a doctrine, or on a way of life is one of the most difficult things to experience because... We derive security in our understanding of Scripture 
so that we believe we are on the way. That twinge of anxiety, maybe some of you feel right now as you're thinking about like what it's like to potentially be theologically incorrect or have an incorrect practice or one that's not as full of the gospel as it could be, that feeling, that's the same feeling the Pharisees had, but worse. The Pharisees had it worse when Jesus was talking to them about doing it a different way. This process of being willing to be corrected is normal to the discipleship process of following Jesus Christ. And the willingness to be corrected is foundational to your ability to pursue truth. Your ability to pursue truth in the Gospels, in Scripture, in life with God in your faith is directly related to your capacity to be able to stand corrected. It's tough. It can be tough. But I will say this, on the other side of that is growth, is liberation, is more freedom, and it is the experience of being drawn closer to God. We must have the willingness to admit when we are wrong, or at least to say, I could be wrong. True wisdom of a man consists in two things, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of himself. Knowing God involves humility because it requires acknowledgement of our own limitations and constant need for God's grace. John Calvin. I think the challenges that come with changing your mind, the challenges that come from being, able, from being willing to be corrected in these things is so good because it makes you realize how much bigger God's grace is. Take a few steps back. I just mentioned that my experience is the more I learn about God and the, the, the more I realize I don't know. I talked about it like a yawning gap. What that does is if the gap is this big, because I think I know a lot and I know it all. I don't need to study as much or I've got it figured out pretty good and I don't need to be I don't need to think I could be wrong. That gap right there is God's grace that I need in my life. Now, if I have the experience of being willing to be corrected and I have a yawning gap where I constantly realize how much more divine God is than I am, how much smarter God is, holier, wiser, bigger, grander, more powerful, this gap keeps getting bigger and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get, never going to get there, oh, right? That yawning gap as I get older and experience how much more I've learned and how much I don't know. Here's the thing. God's grace bridges that gap every time. That is the entire principle behind God with us, is that God is willing to bridge the gap and meet you exactly where you're at. So even when you experience this, the side effect of experiencing that is a bigger comprehension of God's grace in your life. You know what a bigger comprehension of God's grace in your life will do for you? It'll make you more graceful towards others too. It really will. Lastly, curiosity. It's the last C that you need to, to put that C4 and blow this thing wide open for yourself. It's curiosity. Be curious. Ask questions. One of my favorite characters in Scripture is Jacob, the man who was able to wrestle with God and would not let go until he was blessed. He walked away limping, but he got to wrestle with God. The idea of Israel being a people who wrestle with God. Jacob, the father of Israel, his name was changed to Israel in the Old Testament. A people who wrestle with it. The idea of being curious is a, um, it's again, it's a posture of learning, but it's also a posture of wondering what else is there? What more is there? St. Augustine says it better than me. St. Augustine, a famous saint, said, do not be content with what you know, what, what you 
know and understand of Scripture now, but press on. And even if what you already know should become less dear, regard it as not as lost, but as part of a search for a greater and richer understanding. Don't be satisfied. My thing is, the way, this is one of the ways that I generate my own personal curiosity. I don't want to miss out. It's a little bit of FOMO. Fear of missing out generally is sometimes because I'm curious because the more I realize that my image of God is not the actual God that exists entirely because it's impossible for me to fully comprehend what this is, right? It's impossible because if it was possible, then I'm God, but it's not. So whatever image I have is not a one-to-one match. And because of that, and because of the way I believe God is good, I'm curious. Where do I have my image off? How can I get it closer to the way that it is? And I'm curious, what would my life look like if I did? I wonder what my life would look like if I found a way to see Scripture more through Jesus Christ or practice the Scriptures differently. I wonder. This curiosity. The curiosity is what helps make Scripture relevant. That's what helps make Scripture relevant. I wonder what these people thought when they went through this. I wonder what just the simple curiosity of wanting to know more and if there is more can go a long way because it also keeps you in a posture of humility, a willingness to read. So we ask the question, how do I read this thing? How do I read this thing? What do I do with this thing? This library of books that's been written over thousands of years, been studied by millions of people. It's so big. How do I read this thing? We do it through having a Christ-centered lens. Allowing Christ to be the absolute main lens through which you view God. As you read the New Testament, the Old Testament, let it stand on its own. That's fine. But that Christ-centered lens. We have to commit to a path of growth. We have to not try to just make it a race. We have to be willing to stand corrected. And we have to remain curious. Now, friends, these things might sound simple, and, and I know that uh, as you crack open the Scripture and you try to do this, uh, it might not seem like I've given you the exact tools to tell you exactly how to read the Bible. That's because there is, um, there's no way to give you a definitive way of reading the Bible where you're going to come up with an answer today that will last you the rest of your life. Because there is not a univocal presentation of God in Scripture, right? That I said there's not a univocal presentation. That also means there's not a univocal one in your experience either. My experience of when I'm reading these Scriptures might be a little bit different than yours. It's not univocal. My image of God, because of my research, my understanding, might be different than yours, Right? Because I'm not you, you're not me. And that's okay. What these principles do is it gives you a way forward. And I promise you, if you do them, you can get through a lot. I've been through theological shifts in my beliefs. I've been through being um, having my uh, theology change so much that I was no longer accepted in certain denominations. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to go through things in life that challenge what you thought about God. I know what that's like. And I can tell you this. These principles here that I just talked about have anchored me through it all. Through it all. I learned it the hard way because my theological challenges almost made me walk away from my faith. Almost did. And I was fortunate enough to come across other people who taught me these things as well. And so my hope for you today, friends, is this that you realize that being planted by the water 
being refreshed, meditating upon God's word. It's not my chapter for the day. It's not that. It's getting to know the person of Jesus Christ. It's having that curiosity. It's that willingness to be corrected. It's about those types of things. Because I promise you, you can be a data pad full of information about the Bible and still not be planted by the waters and and capable of prospering wherever you're at. Promise. That's one of the reasons why Jesus was fulfilling it and changing it and making it about himself. And so, friends, I hope that today you got something from this. As always, if you'd like to talk more or, hey, you're saying, hey, I want to do that, but I want an actual plan. Like, can we sit down and talk about a plan for how to maybe set me forward? I'd love to do that too. Otherwise, I hope that today you're going to walk away feeling like you have a little bit of a a path forward in how to read this thing and make it not so overwhelming. Let's pray. And as we pray, I'm going to go ahead and include our prayer request that we had for today. Um, in our prayers. And at the end of it, I'm going to give us a chance to say our own private prayer uh, before we do the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, which illuminates our path. Your word, which refreshes our soul. Your word, which cleanses our mind. The Apostle Paul said to be transformed by the renewing of our mind may be centered around the person of Jesus Christ. God, help us to be in a position of learning, in a position of openness, recognizing that we will continue to grow and learn and be developed and discipled for the rest of our lives. And it is a joy to have that because there's always more of you, more to discover, more to behold more fullness to experience. God, help us to remain curious. Be bigger for us. Help our minds to see you in a bigger light. Help us to be more amazed by your grandeur, your majesty. Continue to reveal yourself to us both personally and corporately. God, help us to commit to this path of growth knowing that it's not about always getting it right, that sometimes it's literally just about failing forward, saying, hey, I don't know everything about this, but I'm going to read this. I'm going to practice this. I'm going to learn from this. And I'm going to trust that the grace of God bridges the gap of even my lack of knowledge, because it does. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for that as well. And now, Lord, we want to pray for our prayer request We have those who want to pray for uh, their sister, Jennifer's first grandson. Must be a recent birth. We pray that the the family does well and that they they find time for rest and and to have the support they need and for just a healthy child. Uh, It says, please pray for Christina. She's battling cancer. God, many of us have been impacted by the terrible, terrible disease of cancer. I know I've been. It's a challenge for many. God, be with Christina. Give her strength. Give her body strength. Whatever is being done medically, may it be effective. Give them favor, we pray. And prayer for two sons that are struggling to make good choices as they're growing up. God, we know that the process of becoming an adult or growing up is, is challenging in our times. It can be very challenging. The process of individuation, of developing your own mind, of Figuring things out can be tough. And in that process, we make mistakes. In that process, we make choices that maybe we wouldn't wish we had. So God, for these two, two sons, I pray for your wisdom. I, I pray for your grace and your compassion, for the relationship between the sons and the parents. God, we pray for uh, patience. We pray for love. Uh, we pray for a way forward where uh, it is uh, the best interest of uh, the sons that are, is in mind, Uh, Because I know that can be challenging to have those conversations and to try to give direction, God. Have your hand on that situation. Let there be love, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. For Pastor Alex and his family who are dealing with their sickness and COVID, God, help them to recover. Help them to be packed to fullness of health. Uh, We're looking forward to Pastor Alex being here. And now, brothers and sisters, I encourage you, lift up your own personal prayer in silence before we collect our prayers together with the Lord's Prayer.
Now, brothers and sisters, let us collect our prayers together at the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.